Leia here from LeiaForSci.com, and in this video I'll take you through the reaction and mechanism for hydroboration oxidation. You can find my entire series on alkene reactions along with my alkene practice quiz by visiting my website LeiaForSci.com slash alkene reactions. Hydroboration is an interesting reaction because it is both regioselective and stereoselective. Our starting molecule has a pi bond between a secondary and a primary carbon. And when the pi bond breaks, you'll have a hydrogen atom adding to the secondary carbon and the alcohol adding to the primary carbon, making it an anti-Markovnikov reaction. But because hydrogen and alcohol add to the same face of the pi bond, that makes it a syn addition. Hydroboration has two steps with a few too many reagents. So if you forget one of them, don't worry. The clue, the key to recognize is boron. Anytime you see boron, you will likely have a hydroboration reaction. Before we go into the mechanism, let's talk about boron. Boron is one of those exceptions to the octet rule, where it's perfectly happy having a total of six rather than eight electrons in its valence shell. Here we have BH3, with three hydrogens and therefore six electrons, giving me an sp2 hybridized boron with an mtp orbital. Now even though boron is perfectly happy with that mtp orbital, other atoms will not respect it and they will use their electrons to attack boron to form a fourth bond. In recognizing that boron does not like that fourth bond is how you'll recognize the sequence of this reaction. This reaction has two steps. The first step in this mechanism is hydroboration. We'll take boron and line it up with the less substituted of the pi bound carbons, and the hydrogen goes to the more substituted carbon. This allows the two other hydrogens to hang off at the end of the molecule. Remember that the pi electrons in a double bond are highly reactive, making it the nucleophile in this reaction, and we'll show the pi bonds attacking the empty orbital of boron. Now boron doesn't want that fourth bond, so to balance, it's going to kick off the hydrogen atom. When it kicks off hydrogen with the electrons, where does hydrogen go? To the newly freed up carbon atom from the starting pi bond. We get a non-isolated intermediate for this reaction, which looks like a square, and that shows the pi bond breaking, a bond forming between carbon and boron, the bond between boron and hydrogen breaking, and a new bond forming between hydrogen and the carbon atom. The intermediate for this reaction has a hydrogen on the tertiary carbon and boron with its two hydrogen atoms on the primary carbon. In order to understand Markovnikov's rule, recognize that the reason we had to line up the BH3 in this manner is because hydrogen is small and can fit on the inside of the molecule and boron with its groups will kind of hang over the side and not have any interference with the rest of the carbon chain. But looking at this molecule, BH2, how is that considered bulky? And the answer doesn't come from here. The answer comes from the fact that boron still has that empty p orbital and is still going to get attacked by some other molecule in solution. In fact, the way this reaction occurs, we don't have just one starting alkene. We have thousands and thousands of these alkenes in solution and another of the starting alkenes will line up with boron using its pi bond to attack the empty p orbital. And once again, we have hydrogen getting kicked off and adding to the carbon atom. This is going to happen a total of three times, giving me a boron bound to three different alkyl groups. This is called a tri-alkyl borane because we have three alkyl groups attached to the central boron. For the rest of this video, I'm simply going to substitute each of these carbon chains with an R, R showing the carbon chain or simply the rest of the molecule, and that will make it easier to draw the additional steps. Your professors will not necessarily ask you for every step along the way, but it definitely helps to understand so you can make sense of why and how the product comes out the way it does. The second part of this mechanism is the oxidation step. And to show that oxidation step, we want to take a look at what happens with our solution. We're using hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, in a basic solution of NaOH, all of it dissolved in water. Recognize that NaOH is a base where Na plus is simply a spectator ion, we can get rid of it, and OH minus is the reactive base in question. We'll have an acid-base reaction happening before we even attack boron, 
And what you'll see here is the OH- reaches for a hydrogen on the hydrogen peroxide, giving oxygen back its electrons. This gives me an unstable anion to continue in the next step, and it's unstable because two oxygen atoms will never be happy when they're bound directly to each other. Going back to our trialkyl borane, don't forget, boron still has that empty p orbital, and that means it's still reactive and still susceptible to an attack. So we'll show our HOO minus anion attacking boron at its empty p orbital and giving boron a total of four bonds. This is where you want to pay close attention to the formal charge on all the atoms. If you're not comfortable quickly finding the formal charge, go back to my video which you can find on my website at layerforsci.com slash origobasics. Notice that oxygen attacked boron using its third lone pair of electrons, so it went from having too many electrons with a formal charge of minus one to neutral, but boron, which likes to have only three directly attached, now has a total of four, and that gives boron an extra electron with a formal charge of minus one. Born is not happy and is desperate to find a way to kick off those extra electrons. And the only way it knows to do so is to take one of the R groups and just kick off the bond between itself and that R group. We'll show this by looking at the electrons that bind boron to the blue R group. These electrons will get kicked off and go onto the oxygen atom instead, the first of the two oxygens that is bound to boron. Oxygen does not want to have that third bond, so to compensate, oxygen is going to happily break the bond between itself and the other oxygen atom. Pay very careful attention to what happened to every atom, every group, and every lone pair as we redraw the next step. We have boron bound to the purple R group, bound to the green R group, no longer bound to the blue R group, but we'll show it where it used to be. We had a bond between boron and the first oxygen atom, which had two black lone pairs of electrons, and next to that we had an OH with two lone pairs as well. We have the red electrons that formed a bond between the two oxygen atoms. Now it sits as a lone pair on the oxygen, giving me a free hydroxide in solution. We also had the green bond between boron and the blue R group, which now sits as a bond between oxygen and the R group, and boron once again is happy having just three instead of four bonds. Looking at the formal charge, the negative from boron transferred to hydroxide, and boron is once again neutral. I wrote it this way so you can clearly see what's going on, but let's rewrite it to make it easier to follow. We have boron bound to the purple and the green R groups, and now instead of being bound to the blue R group, we have the oxygen atom with its two lone pairs of electrons, and that oxygen is bound to the blue R group with the green electrons that moved. Now remember, if boron started out as a trialkyl borane, this reaction is going to happen another two times where we have two HOO minus attacking boron one at a time, so we have that internal shift, and that will give me a boron that is no longer bound to three R groups, but instead bound to three OR groups. Now don't forget, boron once again has three bonds, sp2 hybridized, and an MTP orbital. Remember all those hydroxide groups we kicked off, and the fact that we're in a basic solution? That means we have OH- in solution that is still feeling quite reactive, and the OH- will attack boron again in its empty p orbital, and this time, because we don't have any more carbon atoms to kick out, what we're kicking out instead is the OR group one at a time. After the first attack, we're left with boron still bound to the purple and the green OR group, but in place of the blue OR group, we now have an OH bound, and now floating freely in solution, we have an RO minus. Don't forget, the solvent here is water, and that means we have lots and lots of free-floating water molecules. The type of solution is basic, which means it's okay to form hydroxide, and so the OR is going to use one of its negative electrons to grab the hydrogen off of a water molecule, giving the oxygen back those binding electrons. This gives me one of my three final products, which is a hydrogen atom bound to oxygen bound to the R group. 
We turned our starting alkyl group into an R for the simplicity of the mechanism, but now we'll add it back. The tip, the very end of this molecule, now has an oxygen bound from that peroxide attack, and it has a hydrogen that was plucked off of a water molecule in solution. We also have the OH, now with an extra lone pair and a negative charge, which is okay because we had a base catalyst and we regenerated. This is going to happen two more times so that we get three alcohol products and then boron is going to wind up bound to three OH groups in solution. Now, if you followed this mechanism and found it slightly overwhelming, don't worry about it. Most professors will not ask you to do the entire thing, but it definitely helps to understand that the fact that we have three groups is how we make the boron bulky and why we need to have boron at the end of the molecule. And it also helps you see what's going on in terms of the anti markovnikov yetsin addition. For my complete video series on alkene reactions, along with my practice quiz, visit my website, layerforsci.com slash alkene reactions. Are you struggling with organic chemistry? Are you looking for resources and information to guide you through the course and help you succeed? If so, then I have a deal for you. A free copy of my ebook, 10 Secrets to Acing Organic Chemistry. Use the link below or visit orgosecrets.com to grab your free copy. After downloading your free copy of my ebook, you'll begin receiving my exclusive email updates with cheat sheets, reaction guides, study tips, and so much more. You'll also be the first to know when I have a new video or live review coming up. If you enjoyed this video, please click the thumbs up and share it with your organic chemistry friends and classmates. I will be uploading many videos over the course of the semester, so if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, do so right now to be sure that you don't miss out.